Hey guys, Alex here from Blender Academy. Today, we're going to talk about everything you need to know before you get started rendering in Blender. You've seen the amazing images and animations that people get out of Blender. But trying to navigate the ocean of tutorials out there in order to figure out how to achieve those kinds of results is a bit daunting, if not downright soul crushing, especially when you're just starting out and can't afford to waste a ton of time learning things that aren't relevant to your particular situation, or worse, that lead to bad habits or mistakes that will cost you down the line. That's why I put together this list of the five critical concepts you need to know before getting started rendering in Blender to help you understand the fundamentals and set you off on the right course. But first, a quick warning. This video isn't for beginners who are completely new to Blender. You should at least be familiar with the concepts we cover in our Getting Started with Blender video. I've added a link to that video in the description. All right, let's jump right into the list with number one, what rendering means. If you're looking for Blender rendering tips on YouTube, it's easy to quickly lose sight of the forest for the trees. Meaning, you might find yourself getting lost in nitty gritty details about render settings and material roughness and any number of other minutia before you understand some of the bigger picture fundamentals. So let's take a step back and start from the beginning. What is rendering? Rendering is the process of turning a 3D scene into a 2D image. When I explain to my students what this means in Blender, I like to think of it in terms of the real world. Imagine you're a photographer and you're on a photo shoot. You've got your camera and lights, and you can set up your scene for the shoot with any number of objects or subjects. When you actually look through the camera and click to snap a photo, that's you rendering a 2D image of that scene in your camera. And it's essentially the same thing in Blender. You have the same basic elements at your disposal to create a scene, add lights, and set up your camera to snap a photo. Even animations are just a series of still 2D photos all strung together. Of course, there are more complexities to how rendering actually works in the intensive computation that goes into it. But for now, this is a great simple way to conceptualize rendering as we move forward to the next thing on our list. Number two, how to set up your model for rendering. When you open the default file in Blender, you have everything you need to create a rendering already in place. A camera, a light, and an object at the center of your scene. Actually, if we wanted to, we could export a rendering of this default cube right now. All right, I'll admit, it's pretty underwhelming. In fact, it's hard to imagine how you get from this to something like this at this point in our journey. But hey, it's just a great cube with a light above it. What'd you expect? Let's set up a quick but better example for the purposes of this video that will help to reinforce the key concepts you'll need to be familiar with when it comes to rendering. Select the cube and delete it by typing X and then pressing Enter. Now there are four key elements to setting up your model for rendering. The first two, a camera and a light, we already have in our scene. Of course, there are all sorts of options and adjustments we can make to these, such as the type of light and its brightness, or the focal length of the camera. And we could move them around our scene as well. But for the purposes of this video, let's just leave both as they are. One thing to note about the camera is that no matter where we orbit as we build our model, the rendering output in Blender will be from the view of the camera, and not whatever the current view is we're looking at. What do I mean by that? Well, if we go to the View menu and select Camera, or use the shortcut of zero on our number pad, we'll see the view through our camera, looking at the objects in the scene. Hitting zero on your number pad again will toggle you back to your orbited view. Now, we don't have time to cover everything about cameras and lights in this video. We'll just cover the basics you need to know for rendering. But we do have comprehensive courses on our site that cover all of that. All right, the next key element with setting up your model for rendering is creating the 3D model itself. We'll need something to render after all. And of course, your model could be anything you create. But for our example, let's press Shift A and under Mesh, pick the option for Plane. Then press S and move your mouse to scale it up. Let's add one more mesh, again pressing Shift A. And this time, let's select UV Sphere. Then press G for the Move tool. Press Z to lock our movement in the Z direction and move the sphere up so that it's just above the plane. Lastly, right click on the sphere and pick the option for Shade Smooth. Great, we now have a super simple 3D model we can use for our renderings. Let's talk about the last key element, materials. By default, our 3D model has a light gray material. It looks lighter and darker in some areas because of the 3D shading, but it's all the same color. Let's adjust this for the purposes of our example. First, select the plane. Then click on material properties on the right. Click new and Blender will create a new material. You can see its name at the top here. For this example, let's just change the color by clicking the area next to base color. I'll choose a teal. But wait, it doesn't look like anything happened. The plane is still gray. That's because by default, the viewport shading display is set to solid, which means all of our objects are just shown as solid shapes in the default shaded gray texture. We can toggle that to material preview mode to get a better sense of the material changes we're making. Next, let's change the color of the sphere. Select it, then follow the same steps. 
Under Material Properties, click New and change the base color. I'll choose a pink for contrast. Now, let's change one more thing about the sphere's material. Next to Roughness, click on the value and drag it to the left until you get down just below 0.3. This lowers the roughness, which makes the material more shiny or reflective. Of course, there's a lot more to know about materials that we don't have time to cover in this video. This is just a quick example, but we do cover everything you need to know about setting up your materials the right way in the courses on our website. All right, we've set up our simple example model for rendering. That leads us to the next concept on our list. But before we get too far, we're covering a lot of ground in this video. So I've gone ahead and put together a free set of notes that will make it easy for you to review everything. I've added a link to download them in the description. Okay, back to the tip. Number three, how complexity affects rendering. While our example model is extremely basic, the 3D models you build to render for your own projects will likely be more complex. And generally, the more complex your models are, the longer it will take your computer to create a rendering. As I mentioned earlier, rendering can be a very intensive task for your computer. We'll talk more on why that is later in this video. But for now, here are a few helpful things you should be mindful of before you start modeling to help you alleviate some of the frustration that comes with lengthy render times down the road. First, mind your polygon count. As you'll remember from our Getting Started with Blender video, every mesh in Blender is made up of vertices, edges, and faces. And those faces make up the number of polygons in your scene. The more polygons you have in your scene, the more surfaces there are for light to bounce off of, which means the more there is for your computer to calculate. Of course, you don't want to sacrifice the quality of your renderings just to keep your polygon count down, but there are times where it may make sense to use less polygons. For instance, if you're modeling an object that you know will only be small and in the background of your rendering, you won't notice a difference in your final image if you simplify the object, but that can help speed up your rendering. The next thing to be aware of is the number of lights. We're only using one light in our example, but more often than not, you'll have more in your model. And the more lights you have, the more light rays there are bouncing around your scene, each one adding to the complexity of the calculations your computer must make. All right, the last thing to note is material settings. Again, we only made one adjustment to the roughness in our material settings for our example, but you'll probably be adjusting more for your own models. And the more you use material settings that cause light to reflect, refract, and scatter, the more complicated it is for your computer to calculate the way light travels through your scene, which, you guessed it, will lead to slower render times. We cover the right way to work through all three of these things in much greater detail in the courses on our website. But for now, know that if you keep these things in mind as you build out your model, especially as your scene gets more and more complex, you can save yourself a ton of time and headache later when it comes to lengthy render times. Your future self will definitely thank you. All right, we've got a few more helpful tips regarding render times when it comes to your settings in your computer hardware that we'll talk about in a bit. But first, let's dive into the next thing on our list. Number four, how to create a rendering. We've got our example file set up, and now we're ready to create a rendering. How do we do that? It's actually a super simple step. But first, here's a cool trick. In the viewport shading menu, let's toggle from material to rendered. This gives you a rough preview of what your materials and lighting will look like in your final rendering, even as you orbit around. Pretty cool, right? Now, to actually create a rendering, all we have to do is go under the Render menu and select Render Image. And there you have it. Remember that the final rendering will be from the angle of your camera, not your current view. To save a rendering you create, in the Render Preview window, click Image, Save. Now, keep in mind that these are just the default Blender settings when it comes to the rendered output. That actually leads us right into our next tip. Number five, how to set render and output properties. While there are a ton of different options and adjustments you can make in the output properties and render properties panels, far too many to cover in this video, let's go over a few of the essential settings you'll need to be familiar with to get started with your own renderings. Start by opening the output properties panel. The most important setting in this panel and the only one you really need to be concerned with at this point in your rendering journey is the resolution. Here, you can set the dimensions for the final image that you'll create. I'll leave it set to 1920 in the X direction by 1080 in the Y direction, which is the standard pixel dimension for a 16 by 9 HD image. But you can set these to any dimension you need. Just keep in mind, the larger you set the resolution, the longer it will take your computer to render your image. We'll talk more about that in a moment. First, let's switch over to the Render Properties panel. Again, there are a bunch of advanced settings you don't need to know about yet in this panel. But there is one critical thing you'll want to understand. Render Engine. The render engine is the process by which your computer calculates how to turn your 3D scene into a 2D image. And there are major differences between the options in this dropdown. Blender defaults to Eevee, 
The other two options are Workbench and Cycles. We're going to ignore Workbench for the purposes of this video, since it's used to show us our model while we're working on it, not for the type of rendering outputs we're talking about. Which leaves us with Eevee and Cycles. Let's talk about why you might choose one over the other depending on your particular situation. Here's a look at our example scene rendered with both. As you can see, there are some notable differences between the two. Let's break down why they're so different. First, Eevee is what's known as a real-time or rasterizing render engine. And Cycles is what's known as a path tracing render engine. Put simply, real-time render engines estimate how the lighting looks in your scene in order to generate a rendering relatively quickly, while path tracing engines actually calculate the path of each and every ray of light in your scene, giving you a more photorealistic result, but at the expense of much longer render times. How much longer? Let's try it with our example model. Set the render engine to Eevee if it isn't already, then in the top menu, click Render, Render Image. Note how fast it's rendered, almost instantaneously, at 0.2 seconds on my machine. Now, let's try the same thing with the engine set to Cycles. Toggle Eevee to Cycles in the Render Properties panel. You'll notice your viewport progressively loading each pixel color as it calculates how the light should bounce around the scene. That's because we still have our viewport shading set to Rendered. Now, go ahead and select Render, Render Image again. With Cycles, you'll see that the render preview progressively loads while it renders your final image. Once the rendering is complete, note the time. 15 seconds on my machine. That's 75 times longer for the Cycles rendering. Now, that definitely doesn't mean every Cycles rendering will take 75 times longer than an Eevee rendering. The difference depends on a lot of factors. Far too many to completely cover in this video, but there are a couple of important ones I should mention. First, we already talked about minding the complexity of your model back in tip number three, as well as the output resolution being an important factor. For instance, this same image using cycles at a resolution of 1280 by 720 only took seven seconds to render. The other important difference maker to note is your hardware. Whether your scene is simple or complex, your render engine works faster the more powerful your CPU and GPU are, as well as the more RAM you have. All right, enough about speed. Let's analyze the differences in quality between the two results side by side. While they look similar, you can see that because Cycles accurately calculates the lighting, it's showing much more nuance in the way light bounces off the surface of the plane and back to the sphere to add light to the shaded area. We can also see the reflections of the plane itself in the sphere. If we look closely, we can even see the sphere itself bouncing some light into its shadow on the plane as well. So while Eevee was much faster, Cycles produced a far superior result. But which one's right for you? That'll depend on your particular situation. For instance, in our case, 15 seconds isn't too long to wait in order to get the better result. However, for bigger jobs where a Cycles rendering would take too long, you might get enough realism from Eevee to make it worth the time savings. All right, you made it through the list, and now you know what rendering is and how it works in Blender, and you're ready to get started rendering the right way with your own projects. What's next? From here, it's definitely possible to learn Blender on your own. But if you're serious about learning Blender and can't afford to waste time or pick up bad habits, we're building a comprehensive video course that incorporates all the lessons we've learned from teaching in person over the years. Head over to our website now to learn more. Or if you're not ready to check out our courses just yet, be sure to at least watch the videos on this playlist. Until next time, happy blending.